Well, let's get started. Uh, again, this is Jonathan Coppice. I'm and here with Nick Paulson as well. And we're going to uh, we're going to do a quick overview of of the farm program decisions and the uh, online resources that we've got available here uh, to help farmers and to help you all help farmers uh, sort through the thicket of this farm bill program uh, situation. Gary Schnicki is unable to join us today, but he obviously has been very instrumental in the work that uh, we've been doing. We just uh, up front want to make a quick note and say a big thank you to the uh, coalition that we've developed around the, uh, the building of these online resources. Um, the, the universities there, you see listed there, have been uh, very helpful as we tried to put all this together, particularly on the outreach side and the uh, educational side, getting word out to farmers. And, of course, our friends at Watson Associates who have done an outstanding job helping to uh, build the online uh, web application or the online calculator. So we appreciate the, the great help we've gotten from everybody. Just for your notes, uh, if you want to uh, jump online, um, you can see the two uh, websites. These two websites are linked, um, and they, they kind of work together, and we'll show you how that does, but uh, how that works. But you see there the Farm Bill Toolbox uh, that's housed here at the University of Illinois. And uh, that's kind of your one-stop resource for all aspects of this decision-making. We'll go through that. And then the web-based application or the online calculator is the Agricultural Policy Analysis System, or APAS, and you can see its website down there as well. Um, And you can start with either one of those, and there'll be links uh, to the other one. The other thing I'd note is, in case you don't remember this long email address, uh, you can jump on your favorite search engine and just type in Farm Bill Toolbox, and this should be one of the first things that that uh, shows up on the search. Um, so pretty easy way to get to, uh, to this information. And you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen uh, the uh, front page of the Farm Bill Toolbox, and we'll go there in just a minute. Um, just to make sure everybody knows the dates uh, or deadlines for these decisions, um, and we'll go through these decisions in detail, but um, what you see here, February 27th right now is the, uh, the deadline for the decisions to update payment yields or retain and reallocate base acres. And March 31 is currently the deadline for the program election between ARC County, Agriculture Risk Coverage County, uh, Agriculture Risk Coverage Individual Farm, or Price Loss Coverage, the PLC program. Um, Right now, FSA is saying that deadline is going to be March 31st, but they have left themselves a little bit of flexibility to push that back if they needed. And we will update uh, as we uh, get updates from FSA. So we're going to... uh, start through the toolbox and what we've created here to help if you go to the right hand side of the screen what we've put together um, I also just want to make a quick note about the uh, there is a tool there for the dairy programs if you go down you can see all the webinars we've been doing we've been doing a webinar every Friday morning we've got one more uh, that we're going to do this week uh, and then we will um, we will archive all of those and we'll in the new year, we'll do some more uh, webinar series to uh, to kind of pick up where we left off and provide new information. But all that's housed here on this uh, Farm Bill toolbox. And then what we're going to go through is for the ARC PLC uh, decisions, the program decisions, we've created a series of steps. You see them here at the top. There's about seven steps. Uh, we've got an overview that kind of discusses what goes on. And then we're going to start um, step one. And, and as we go through this, each step has information below it as well as links to, uh, to um, further information, including videos. Um, and uh, so we'll just start with step one. And, uh, Nick, this is the FSA letter. This is collecting mm-hmm. your information. And so this is uh, the most important thing is this letter here from FSA that everybody should have got back in August. Yep, and uh, I don't think we can, at this point, this time of year, uh, stress enough that, you know, this is probably what what farmers should be spending their time on right now is making sure that they have that letter, all the uh, information in that letter is accurate. Um, uh, All the decisions, whether it's the update yield, uh, reallocate base, or the uh, program election, um, you know, those deadlines are still out in February or March, so uh, there is time to educate yourself, but, but this is the first step. You can't really, uh, your, a farmer's use or anyone's use of the tool is going to be, um, much better. Their time's going to be much better spent if they have collected this information and made sure that it is accurate before they really start doing any, uh, individual analysis. Then the other thing that's needed is that yield history for 2008 to 12, which will help you with the calculator. 
Um, and we'll get into that as far as updating uh, the payment yields. And that's step two here in the toolbox. Um, as you see, we've got, again, a, a host of uh, information and resources on that. Um, the basics of this decision, uh, Nick, is whether or not the landowner wants to update the, the historical payment yields on that farm. Um, you know, the main thing is we're looking at 90% of the yields for that farm um, between from 2008 to 2012 crop years. And right. Yep. Um, and, and yeah, in addition to that FSA letter, this, this should be the other uh, set of information that the that, that farms are collecting, um, uh, trying to put together uh, the documentation that would be accepted in case there is an audit on this uh, updating yield decision. Um, Jonathan can add to this if, if he wants, but it will be a self-certification process. The, the yield numbers that are provided for that, those 2008 through 2012 crop years um, in the, in the updating yield calculation. But, uh, if, if there are spot checks or audits, uh, they will, farmers will need to provide documentation for those. And we do know, uh, that, that crop insurance records, uh, will be accepted. There's a, a number of other, um, uh, acceptable documentation, uh, sources as well on those. But, um, yeah, beyond the FSA letter, uh, putting together that yield history would be the other piece of information to start going through and making these decisions. And a couple big notes on this decision. Now, the first and foremost is this is a decision for the landowner. So the owner of those base acres is going to make this decision. Uh, the updated payment yield decision is a crop by crop decision. Um, so you can update payment yields for one crop and not for others, depending on where that 90% of the average of 2008 to 12 comes out. And then just one overriding issue that we want to make sure everybody's very uh, clear about. When we talk about farms in this entire discussion and process, we're talking about the FSA farm. Uh, that is the FSA farm that has a number from the Farm Service Agency. Uh, it will be listed on that on that letter. But each one of these decisions, everything will be made by FSA farm. And so many, many farmers have multiple FSA farms they will be dealing with. And so they will be sorting through this for each one of those FSA farms. Uh, we've got a quick example uh, for updating the yields. And if you go over to the APAS tool, and you see the website up there, um, one of the things we have available is the ability to calculate uh, your yields uh, for the updated decision on a crop-by-crop -crop basis in a uh, quick calculator. So you can, you can do this uh, before going through the entire uh, tool. And I'll just real quickly, you see um, there on the right, on the left-hand side of the screen, a... Uh, an example of, of some yield history here, yeah. and I'll just enter these in. While Jonathan's entering those numbers in, again, um, we do have the quick calculator option uh, in the APAS tool. So, you know, partially because this is a relatively straightforward decision, it can be kind of separated from uh, reallocating base in the program election. And this might be something that, that landowners uh, want to consider kind of by itself. Um, we do have this quick calculator uh, built in. Uh, you don't need to really enter in. Uh, a significant amount of farm information. All you need is your your county, the crop you're looking at, and then the yield history for that crop. Um, we're going to just show you the three examples that you see in the slide on the left. Um, so the first example that Jonathan has entered, there would, would have been a uh, corn yield uh, available to report for this FSA farm for each of the five years uh, in this history. So from the 174 bushels grown in 08 to the 107 bushel yield actual yield in 2012. And then the other thing that this quick calculator does is it incorporates uh, the plug yield, um, uh, which is a county specific county and crop specific number uh, that is used if an actual yield falls below that level. So for Champaign County, for corn, it's uh, the plug yield is 121 bushels. If we change the county and the crop, that, that number on the right there would update. And you can see where Jonathan's entered the yield history. For 2012, when he entered that 107 bushel yield, that automatically updated to uh, to 121. And then so 90% of the average of those five yields then would have been 146 bushels per acre. So that would be your optional uh, updated yield number uh, uh, for, for that first example. And this one's pretty simple. If your current payment yields are, is less than that, then you'd want to update and, and use that, that higher number. So this one's a, a fairly simple one for the farmer. Uh, here, we knock out a couple years on this second example. We'll just do this one real quick, and let's explain what that's doing and why. 
Right. So uh, in this case, you know, you could think of this as being the, the farms in a rotation. So grew corn in 08, 2010, 2012. Um, no yield because corn was not grown on the farm in 2009, 2011. Uh, in that case, you, you leave those years blank uh, in the quick calculator. And the way FSA will handle this is just those three year, years where there, there was a crop grown on the farm uh, will matter. So now the updated payment yield you see on the right there is 139. That's 90% of the average of the 08, 2010. And then again, the plug yield uh, that's used in place of the actual in 2012. Um, so just wanted to show you an example there of, of how it's handled when, when, when a crop wasn't growing on the farm. And this is going to be true even if you've only got one year where you grew corn on this farm, they would take 90% of that one year. Um, if you didn't grow corn, if there were zero planted acres um, for the crop uh, on the farm, then that year is excluded in that five-year yield history. So it could be as few as one year that, that is used to, uh, to, to calculate the yield update uh, okay. level. And the key to this part is that FSA letter again. Any year in which FSA has a record that's, that a crop was planted or considered planted on that farm on those acres for that year, you need to have a yield entered in here. Um, but if, if there was no record of a planting of that crop, then you don't need to, uh, you don't need to enter in, as you see here, this, you wouldn't put zeros in, you actually just leave it blank. Right. So that's one of the, uh, one reminder of the importance of that FSA letter in, in, right. in doing all of that. Um, so that's the quick calculator on yield updating. Should also mention that if you have any questions as we're going, uh, we've, we've got them, they, they show up here on the screen and we will uh, try to answer those as we go and as well as take questions at the end. So if anything doesn't, uh, um, isn't clear as we go through it, please uh, just type in a quick question and we'll respond to it. Um, Nick, then we go on to step three, right. which is and our this basic is the, decision. Uh, this is the decision to retain or reallocate base. Um, again, this is not a completely independent decision of, of the other other th other two decisions. The, again, the keeper update payment yields is, is pretty straightforward. If you can increase those payment yields, go ahead and do it. Um, reallocating base acres uh, is, is also something you can kind of consider on its own, but, but you might want to uh, think about your program election decision in terms of whether you, uh, you reallocate base. But this is another uh, uh, decision that's a, a landowner uh, is going to have to to go ahead and and and, and do this with, with FSA. Um, it is a FSA farm decision, uh, as, as is, uh, all the, all, as are all of the decisions we're, we're looking at. Um, and, uh, the, the, I think the key thing here, uh, some, some confusion related to this that we've, uh, we've come across in the past few weeks is you're not going to change the, the total number of base acres on the farm. You're just could potentially change how those base acres are allocated to different crops. Um, so again, it's not an updating base acre uh, decision. You can't increase or decrease or change base total base at all. It'll just change how many base acres are in corn versus soybeans versus wheat or other crops and in, in other other areas of the county. Um, so again, just like the payment yield decision, you're going to have a choice between your current or your old payment yields and the updated payment yields. For the reallocating base acre decision, it's your current base acre allocation or uh, the reallocation based on the crops that you've planted um, uh, from 2009 to 2012. Um, in terms of guidance on this, uh, you know, a few schools of thought, um, you know, we, we're going to advise people to look at the programs and how they might pay out across different crops uh, before they make that base reallocation decision and, and maybe consider, uh, you know, choosing the base acre allocation, whether that's your current or the reallocated numbers that that are going to shift uh, more base acres towards program with larger payments. Um, or, you know, maybe farmers would prefer to, to choose the base acre uh, allocation again, whether that be their current base acres or their reallocated base acres that kind of matches up with, with uh, what they, what they think they'll be planting um, over the, over the next five years. Um, yeah. And, so. a and a couple things that uh, first thing we want to note is this is for all the program crops on the farm. So you can't do this on a crop by crop basis because you're reallocating among uh, the cro program crops that are on that farm. And the other thing we hear a lot about is what happens if, say, I've got wheat base. I haven't planted wheat base from 2009 to 12. So my reallocation would zero out that wheat base. And a lot of people ask, you know, what does that mean it's gone for good? And I think 
the best answer we have is that, that you need to make this decision with the understanding that once that base is zeroed out, if, in, if it is in the reallocation formula, then it's gone and you don't have that, you will not have that base on that farm going forward. And so that's one part of the decision to, to think through as the landowner on this is uh, do you want to continue to have um, those old allocations or possibly give away some of that or, or change some of that old base into, into uh, the more recent plantings. And so that's a, a big part of the decision. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty straightforward in the fact that you're just uh, going to reallocate what's on there. You don't add base. Uh, you can see here on the right-hand side of the screen um, the step three in the Farm Bill Toolbox. Uh, again, we have video uh, and links to the APAS tool online, um, and we'll go to that in just a second. Um, this is from the sample uh, FSA letter, and Nick, while I do this, uh, we'll do a quick calculator mm -hmm. um, using the APAS tool again. You see down here we have a quick uh, calculator for the base acre reallocation decision for the landowner to do um, separately. And, and again, we... In the online tool, the APAS tool, we do have um, you know, various options for users, uh, everything from the custom farm or build your own farm option where you have to enter in all the farm specific information. It takes you through payment yield update, base acre uh, reallocation. Then you can look at different program election scenarios, um, everything from kind of the, the full blown uh, model there and build your own farm to these quick calculators for the payment yield update. Uh, and base acre reallocation decisions. So what Jonathan's doing is is working with the example here on the left. So uh, the table at the top of the uh, of the slide on the left here is the information for a specific FSA farm. Again, this would be what is contained in that letter that the farmer uh, or landowner received from from FSA back in August. Um, what's at the top of that letter is some of the current program information for this farm. So this farm uh, is located in Ward County, North Dakota. Um, it currently has base in three different program commodities, barley, wheat, and canola. Uh, it's got the current base acre allocation uh, listed there at the top. So 25.7 base acres in barley, 112.6 in wheat, and 8.7 in canola. It also has the current payment yields. Um, which are listed as the 2014 CC yields up there. So for the base acre reallocation, what matters are the certified planted acre numbers uh, in that history portion of the table there. So the 2009, 10, 11, and, crop, and 12 crop years. You can see here that uh, this farm planted some barley uh, in, uh, in 2008, but nothing in 2009, 10, 11, or 12. So if we reallocate here, uh, the barley the barley base would go to zero. Uh, planted some peas in 2009 and 12, and some wheat uh, in 10, 11, and 12. So uh, when we reallocate here, um, it's gonna it, it's just gonna change how those total base acres are allocated among uh, among the crops. Um, so what Jonathan's done in the quick calculator is entered in all of the crops for which there is current base. Uh, he's also entered in, so that would be the barley, wheat, and canola, and he's entered in the existing base acres in that column on the left. And then he's also uh, added in, um, uh, do you got a comma instead of a decimal point anywhere or anything? Put a zero there for dry peas. There. Oh, yeah. All right, so uh, he's entered in the, the three crops for which there's current base, the current base acre numbers there in the existing column. Uh, he's also added dry peas because that is a program crop that was planted, even though it doesn't have any current base. Um, it will have base in the reallocation calculation. So 2009, no barley, wheat, canola, the 129.78 in peas, uh, the wheat acreage in 2010 and 11, and then the wheat and dry pea uh, acres in 2012. So what this reallocation will do is shift uh, base out of barley and canola completely because there were no planted uh, acres of those crops from 2009 to 2012. Um, and it'll shift all the base uh, into wheat and dry peas since they were the program crops that were planted in 2009 and 2012. The total base acres is going to be 147. That's the sum of, of, the, of the current base acres in the, in the three crops for which there's current base. And then it's going to be the sum of the uh, basic reallocated base acres, uh, which would again be in wheat and dry peas. 
So the landowner's decision here then is between the 25, 112.6, and the 8.7 versus the uh, wheat and tripees here on the right-hand side. Right. So, so that's uh, the quick calculator. And, and again, it, you know, I, I think people are potentially making this a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. There are a lot of numbers you need to enter. There's you know, averaging going on here, and they're calculating the, uh, the, the, these reallocated numbers based on you know, how you – uh, planted uh, crops on the farm from 2009 to 2012, but ultimately the the landowner is going to have to decide between you know two options: the the existing base allocation and the reallocated base. There's not going to be a range of choices to make. You know, you can't like Jonathan said, it can't be. I'm going to I'm going to change my you know, I'm going to change my barley base here, but not my canola base. You can't do that. It's either uh, your existing allocation or the, the, the reallocation based on that planted acreage history. And we often get asked, can I reallocate to a crop I haven't planted? And the answer is no. You've got to have, you have got to have had that planted record uh, on file with FSA. You couldn't in this, so this example, I couldn't just say, well, I want 100 acres of corn base. Um, that's not how it works. It is, it is determined uh, by what you have planted in these uh, 2009 to 12 crop years. So, right. so that's why it's, it's critical, again, to make sure that, that farmers and landowners have those uh, FSA letters and that the information on those is accurate. And again, that is that APAS tool. Uh, there's a quick calculator. You can also do that in Custom Farms, which we'll show here towards the end. But that's the base acre reallocation decision, uh, step three in our seven-step process. Moving on to step four, uh, now we get into the programs and the decision amongst the ARC County, ARC Individual, and price loss coverage. And the way we've broken this down um, is to start by comparing ARC County and PLC. Uh, one of the things that uh, everybody should be familiar with in this decision is that this one, unlike the base acres uh, decision and the yield payment yield decision, the program decision is made by all of the producers on the farm. And this is uh, this has caught a few people uh, by surprise um, in the regulation. Uh, this is determined by who is sharing risk, the risk of producing that crop, who has the right to share in the marketings from any crop produced. That determines uh, that you are a producer by the, the definition. What that really means is in a cash lease situation, the landlord is not a producer, and therefore the landlord won't make this decision. Uh, only the producer uh, in a cash lease situation will. Uh, that does create a little bit of an issue because it's certainly possible that that, that tenant won't be there for the five-year life of this program decision. And so the producer could be making a decision for future tenants, uh, but that's how it works. And so um, everybody should be aware of that. And, and certainly those uh, cash lease landlords uh, need to understand um, that the producers will be making the program choice, but that program choice will not change for the life of this farm bill. Uh, it is irrevocable, even if a new tenant uh, is brought under that farm. Uh, one other reason why we do the ARC County and PLC comparison first is that these are crop by crop decisions. So they they line up nicely in that uh, you can you can mix and match on the farm uh, on different crops. Uh, as I'm sure many of you know, the Art County decision or the Art County program is a county based revenue program, whereas price loss coverage, uh, provides a, a deficiency payment whenever that MYA, which is the marketing year average price, the national price, is below the reference price uh, in the statute. Um, and we got a little more information on these programs. Here you see the calculation for Art County. Uh, I won't walk through all of this, um, but you realize you're setting up the five-year Olympic average uh, revenue number. The guarantee then is at 86%. You compare the actual revenue in the crop year. Uh, you notice you're using the same market year average prices, so all these programs are using the national uh, market year average price. Your payment rate is that difference between the 86% of the benchmark, the guarantee, uh, and the actual. Always keep in mind with Art County, there's a maximum payment of 10% of this benchmark number, and the way that basically sets up is that this is covering from 86% of the county revenue down to 76% of the county revenue. Uh, it can't go any higher than that or can't uh, be a bigger payment than that. And then Art County pays uh, on 85% of the base acres for the crop. By comparison, price loss coverage uh, is using that reference price. You see them there on the screen uh, for corn is obviously 370 per bushel. And the only way that a payment is triggered then is if the national average, that market year average price, is below that reference price, then a payment is triggered that uh, makes up a, the, the difference between that national average market year average price and that reference price. 
And again, the payments for PLC will be made on 85% of a crop's base acres. Just kind of doing a, a quick comparison of these two programs to think through uh, this decision. Um, from a price standpoint, from where the price uh, assistance uh, works, you see there uh, on the screen, our county is going to use the five-year Olympic moving average of the market year average prices. Um, but the reference price uh, is used as a plug. So any one of those five years where that, re where that market year average price is below the reference price, you'll be plugging the reference price into the benchmark calculation. Right, By comparison, more. price loss coverage then uses just the reference price. And we're, and we're, you know, we're already, we're definitely seeing an example of that reference price plug playing a role in setting the initial uh, benchmark and Art County revenue guarantee for corn, uh, because I think we had a 355 reference price in 09, um, and that's actually replaced by the 370 reference price uh, in the calculation. I think that price ends up getting dropped regardless. But um, again, if if we get into you know a, a series of crop years uh, here in the next couple of years with prices below 370, um, the Art County price guarantee. Uh, would never be able to, to to fall below that level. And that's a good reminder point that the Olympic moving average is going to use the mo the five most recent crop years, and then you're going to drop out the highest price and the lowest price uh, in that situation. And so um, just a, an important feature of how that works. Um, also comparing across the programs, the, uh, a, the county yields are also uh, calculated on a five-year Olympic moving average. There is a plug for any year where it's, it's really low. If it's below 70% of the transition yield, this is a number calculated by crop insurance. Um, in any case that you have a, a, an average county yield in that year that's below it, then you're going to replace that low yield with the 70% of the T yield. Um, and that's going to be multiplied by this five-year Olympic average price to get your benchmark revenue. Um, by comparison, price loss coverage does not consider uh, yield. There is no coverage on yields. It does use that payment yield. And uh, as we talked about a little bit ago, that could have been updated. Um, but this is a fixed number. This is a fixed number. These do not change over the course of the Farm Bill, um, whereas these will move based on uh, the most recent five years. And then just the coverage, uh, as we mentioned, it triggers from 86 down to 76% of that county revenue. Whereas in price loss coverage, it starts when you're below the reference price and will go all the way down to the loan rate, uh, which in the case of corn is $1.95. So a much wider coverage brand on this price situation, but it's got to get below that reference price to, to trigger. Uh, and then there's, you know, comparing the, the fact that there's no yield coverage in price loss coverage, but it is included in the ARC County. Just another quick comparison, and I think, Nick, to your point, um, if you look at the five, the most recent five-year market year average prices for corn, so 2009 through 13, you see here at the top that 2009 price was 355. It's replaced by this plug, this reference price plug. Um, that's still the lowest price in the five years, so it drops, and you see the red with the asterisks here. Those are the three that are average. And going uh, for this 2014 crop, then we see a pretty high market year average, uh, five-year Olympic average price, 528 as compared to the 370 reference price. So that's an important thing for a farmer to keep in mind as they sort through uh, this program. Mm -hmm. We're using different price components uh, in the calculation. Also having to realize that our 2014 county yields are probably going to be uh, uh, well above average throughout most of the Corn Belt. So uh, that will obviously counteract, I guess is maybe the right word to, in calculating that actual revenue number for our county and, and what the what the payment might be. Yeah, and that's a, always keeping in mind that, that our county is using the prices and the yields in a revenue calculation. Um, we have here just another way of looking at this. Uh, this is from a spreadsheet that's available on the Farm Doc website and the Farm Bill Toolbox. It allow you to just do a very simple calculation or comparison um, between Art County and price loss coverage. And it also helps to lay out the Olympic average, uh, the five-year Olympic average calculations for prices and yields. You see them down here and, um, and how that, that works in the program. And so you can enter in these numbers and you'll see, see this change. The other way to compare it then is in the APAS tool. And if we go to APAS and look at, <clears throat> what are we, Logan County, Illinois? Yeah. We can do a quick calculation, and what you see is you select your state, you select the county. We have three different uh, price forecasts. CBO is the Congressional Budget Office, USDA, 
uh, obviously. And then FAPRI out of the University of Missouri, they do a forecasted price, a baseline type price calculation. And what this really ends up being is that CBO has forecasted higher prices going out the next five years. USDA is a significant lower price forecast. And then FAPRI is kind of in between. And so as you do the quick comparison of the programs, um, it gives you three different price uh, forecasts to look at as a, uh, as a nice way to do a quick sort of snapshot comparison or what we were calling the five-minute analytics on how the programs will work. And the way this sample farm works, again, you pick your state and county. Uh, this coverage level is the crop insurance, the most popular crop insurance uh, coverage purchased in your county. Um, this matters for SCO, which we'll get into in a minute. But just to show what Sample Farms does is it looks at the historical plantings uh, in the counties and then all the counties there in that crop reporting district to give you an idea of, uh, of, of uh, what's going on in the area. And then out of this data and the historical data, it generates a simulated farm or a sample farm uh, for that county. So this is no actual farm, but it's, uh, it's going to come up with these numbers based on what has been planted historically uh, and sort of uh, scaled for a farm that's going to ha- uh, going to earn around a, a five hundred thousand dollar revenue for the farm, and so a good sized farm and a, and a good sample or simulated uh, farm for the example of the, for using the payments. And you see here these numbers, the corn and soybean numbers, then would be your base acres that we'd run through the the analysis. So looking at Logan County, Illinois, at a sample farm uh, with five hundred forty three acres of corn and three hundred seven base acres of soybeans. What you have then is an estimate, uh, estimated or expected program payments. Our county for 2014, the average over 2014 to 2018 for our county, ARC individual, and then the price loss coverage and SCO. And we'll get into some more description of that here in a minute. Um, you can look at this crop by crop and compare them that way. You can also compare them on a single base acre. So this would be a, an expected payment uh, per base acre for Art County and PLC over a one-year horizon and a five-year horizon. And only in that five-year horizon does SCO show up, and we'll explain that in a minute. Uh, and another interesting or another thing to note here is that Art County drops out. Art individual drops out. Excuse me, Art individual drops out when you go crop by crop. Um, and that's a reminder that ARC Individual uses all program crops. You cannot compare it on a crop-by-crop crop basis. Uh, but that, again, is an, a, a quick way to use the sample farms uh, anywhere in the country. Um, the data is available. Uh, those sample farms can be generated, and you can, you can look at how the programs would be expected to operate. Uh, provides a nice way of, of understanding um, the programs and getting a sense. We will move... Just a quick note then, uh, kind of what's going on uh, in this calculation and why you see the difference between ARC County and PLC, uh, and much of that's going to depend on that price forecast. And so if we were to move to the lower USDA prices in the APAS sample farm, you see it change. And uh, one of the reasons, and, and this will change over five years uh, in particular, is what you see here. Uh, and that is the comparison of the price forecast You see CBO in green, USDA in blue, and this red line is the reference price. And so, again, if if the market year average price does not get above this 370, there's no payment triggered. And so you can see from a high forecast price situation a different look in the programs than the lower price uh, from USDA. And just to make sure we all know what prices we're talking about, you can see them here. Uh, here's CBO's projected prices and USDA's projected prices, and you just see that when you get in these out years in particular, uh, USDA is is well below that reference price, and that's going to be triggering the PLC payments. All right, so I think that, you know, we just like to highlight that just because th- this program election, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to say anything is a, a slam dunk decision for any crop, uh, mainly because it's so, uh, especially where prices are right now and where you might think they uh, might be headed over the next uh, four crop years. Um, that 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 really uh, the, the the program you choose really depends on on those price expectations. So uh, if you're if you're relatively bullish, uh, Arc County uh, might seem like the uh, the program to choose for for corn. Uh, maybe also considering Arc Individual in some cases. 
But uh, you know, if you're if you're very bearish and worried about very low prices uh, for corn, then then PLC starts to become uh, much more attractive, especially when you start uh, considering the the potential to to add SCO coverage on top of that. So, yeah, and, the, and we always try to remind everybody that this is not the futures prices; these are the market year average price received by farmers for grain sold in that marketing year, and so that's a pretty different price often than than the futures price, and so. Um, just keeping that in mind and, and to Nick's point, it really becomes because of the high prices the last five years, it really becomes a a sort of exercise in, in guessing, um, or how pessimistic you might be about prices in the, in the coming five years, because this won't change. This program decision will run with the farm for the next five years. And so, um, important to keep that in mind, um, because many of your growers also grow, uh, Soybeans, we did want to just note that for soybeans, um, if we were to go over here and and look at at soybeans and the expected payments, um, what's going on is that uh, all forecast CBO and USDA are currently forecasting all prices in the next five years to be above or well above that reference price. And so no expectation um, that PLC would be effective at all for soybeans um, because of where that that uh, reference price is set in PLC as compared to uh, the way Art County would work. Um, just another kind of couple points there on 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 Art County and PLC. Um, also keeping in mind, as Nick mentioned, that you're using county average yields, so the high yields for 2014 will factor in, as will this 10% maximum. Um, so that'll make uh, a difference too as we consider the, the programs. Um, We've got a couple other crops here uh, just to look at, um, and we'll not actually spend any time on those for now uh, in the interest of time. But you just see the, the quick uh, issue is just kind of where that rev- where that reference price is set compared to where the price forecast. And so you'll see different mm-hmm. payments um, or different payment, expected payments uh, based on that, and the programs will work different. Yeah, so, the, yeah, the main message, I think, is, is corn is probably one of those crops where the decision is the least straightforward at, yeah. at, at this point. Uh, wheat is kind of in that boat as well. Uh, crops like barley and peanuts uh, that Jonathan had in the slides, you know, even the higher uh, end of, of price forecast is still below that reference price. So kind of tends to make PLC uh, look, look even better relative to ARC. Uh, either of the ARC options. Uh, and then uh, soybeans is, is is kind of the opposite uh, price forecast above the reference price, even on the low end of forecasts. Um, so it seems to be a, a slightly clearer picture for soybeans in terms of uh, what what we think producers are going to are gonna want to choose. Yeah, for example, we'll just pick a, a big barley producing county. You can see the difference then uh, for barley in the ARC county and PLC, and that, that comes into play then where that reference price is set compared to the forecast. So certainly uh, a little more difficult of a decision for corn growers, for corn base, than some of the crops that uh, have the higher reference price, um, but just kind of a way to, to sort through and, and understand the programs. And then if things uh, didn't seem complicated <laughs> enough, um, we step five in our process, so now – you know, once uh, landowners, farmers uh, get a handle on on kind of the the revenue versus price protection options and comparing Arc County and PLC on a on a crop by crop basis, uh, we also don't want to completely disregard the Arc individual option. Um, again, this is one of the three program options that that uh, producers on the farm have uh, to choose between. Um, ARC Individual uh, is a little different than the other two, though, because enrolling in ARC Individual is a all-crop decision uh, for the FSA farm. Um, and in fact, it, it can actually be impacted by um, multiple FSA farms uh, locate if, they're, if, if, uh, uh, if, if producers uh, uh, choose this ARC Individual option. So... Art County and PLC, you can mix. Uh, you could put corn and PLC on one FSA farm and, and your soybean base on that same FSA farm in Art County. But if you're uh, looking at Arc Individual, it will roll all crops on that FSA farm together uh, in determining um, your, your, your revenue guarantee in any individual crop year uh, and your actual revenue in any individual crop year. So the way this program works, it, it is a revenue program. Um, and it, it's, uh, the design of it is similar to Art County. It, it does sum or weight the revenues from all crops planted 
uh, all program crops planted on the farm in any given year uh, uh, to determine uh, the revenue guarantee uh, as well as actual revenue. So um, if you're planting 50-50 corn and soybeans on that farm, half your, half your acres in corn, half your acres in soybeans on that FSA farm, the revenue guarantee would be a mix or an average of your uh, historic corn revenues and your historic soybean revenues. And then your actual revenue uh, that's used to calculate the payment would also be kind of a weighted 50-50 average um, of those actual corn and soybean revenues uh, within the year. The more crops you bring into it, uh, kind of the more complicated it, it, it can get. Um, but again, it does matter um, what you're planning on the farm and, and the guarantees and the actual revenues are based on weighted averages uh, of those individual crop specific revenue numbers. And you see, I've just gone through the calculations here on the screen fairly quickly and then using the APAS sample farms uh, as a way to, to look at this as well. And the key issues uh, that Nick highlighted that make ARC County different than ARC, or ARC individual, sorry, different than from ARC County is this multiple crop calculation. And you see it here. Um, on our county, we were doing the five-year Olympic average yield time, the five-year Olympic average price on a crop-by-crop -crop basis. In ARC individual, you're going to actually calculate the revenues first and then run that Olympic average for each crop. And that's going to get you the two different uh, Olympic average revenues. And then um, that 2014 or each crop year's planted acres are going to be used as factors in that, in that calculation. You see that here. Uh, to get to your benchmark, and you and you can see the benchmark calculations. So if we planted 100 base acres, planted 60 to corn, 40 to soybeans, then those weight um, both the benchmark and the actual. It still triggers at 86 percent. It's still a 10 percent maximum, uh, but it it's using a different benchmark, and then your payment rate will work out to be different. Um, and then the other thing you'll notice time and again is that these these are individual payments tend to show up smaller. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with both how this benchmark is set. It's going to end up typically being set lower uh, when you use multiple crops. But also you're only paying on 65% of those total base acres. And so that's going to uh, in impact the size of the payment as well. Um, but certainly something to consider for uh, farmers, uh, particularly those that have strong yield variability on, on an individual FSA farm, um, particularly as it, it relates to the county. Um, and so it's, it's something that, uh, that producers want to work through, at least understand how it works on their farm. Um, and I see we're, we're getting close to the 10 o'clock hour, but we got a little bit of a late start. So we're going to keep going um, and get through the last steps of this and then uh, try to take questions here at the end. Um, Nick, we've got step six now in the, in the decision process. So we've gone through the price loss coverage program as it compares to the ARC County program. We've taken a minute to consider this ARC individual program and how that's going to work. Now, step six, uh, we need to add in yet another uh, maybe complicating factor to the decision, and that is the supplemental coverage option in crop insurance, which is a new crop insurance program. Um, let's go over that a little bit. All right. So, uh, SCO, uh, supplemental coverage option, this is, a, this is a crop insurance program. So, you know, uh, the initial um, main areas of confusion on this are um, you know, just, just to clarify those, SCO would be something the producer would be purchasing uh, from their crop insurance agent. It is a program administered uh, by the risk management agency, not the farm service agency like the ARC and PLC programs are. Uh, so this is a crop insurance program. It's not a commodity program. Um, SCO uh, is a, a county-based program. So uh, producers in, in, of certain crops in many areas of the country are already familiar with uh, area-based uh, crop insurance coverage through what used to be uh, called the GRIP or GRP programs. Um, but again, it, 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 is a, it is a program that is going to trigger payments based on an area uh, measure of yield or revenue. Um, SCO has a fixed coverage level or trigger level of 86%. And the range of SEO coverage is determined um, by uh, the producer's choice of individual insurance plan. So a producer can only buy SEO if they're also buying some form of individual uh, crop insurance coverage through either the yield protection, revenue protection, or revenue protection with harvest price exclusion uh, plans. Uh, so the combo policies. Um, so uh, if the 
and and the SEO program will mimic the type of coverage that the producer elects with their individual plan. So just to give examples of, of those two points, if you're uh, buying a 75% revenue protection plan for your individual coverage and you buy SEO coverage to supplement that, your SEO range will be from 86% down to that 75% coverage level. And your SEO plan will operate or trigger based on county revenues because you're you're buying it in addition to uh, underlying individual revenue coverage. If you were buying 75% YP or yield protection, that SEO plan would, would still be at 86% to 75%, but that would be relevant uh, for, uh, or the county yield uh, would be relevant uh, in determining losses. Um, the other thing with, with SEO is, is the, the losses are triggered based on what happens at the county. The relative size of the indemnity payment that the producer would receive is based on what happens at the county, but the actual dollar amount that they receive is going to be based on the value of their individual insurance deductible. So ultimately what that means is producers with higher APH yields are going to have, uh, would receive larger indemnity payments than another farmer located in the same county uh, with a lower APH yield um, if SCO payments were, were triggered uh, in that county in that year. And that county trigger is an important component to keep in mind um, for producers in this decision because SCO uh, uses that county trigger and, and that means that it's possible for you to have a loss on your farm and the county to not trigger, in which case you would not uh, get an SCO payment um, but it is also possible that, that uh, the county triggers and you don't have a loss, and so that everybody in that county would still get an SCO payment. So that county trigger uh, is an important feature of this to keep in mind and how your yields or farm uh, looks and compared as it compares to way, the way the county moves because it's going gonna, it's gonna to take the county movement to trigger it. Um, the other thing is that the premium for this crop insurance, we got a question about premium here. Uh, we want to remind uh, everybody that the premium for the SEO program is set at 60, is subsidized at 65% of the cost. Um, and the question is, do we know where these premiums are, are going to be set? Uh, I think we've just gotten some initial information from RMA on the rates. Um, yeah, the and we're still sorting through that right now. Last, last week's uh, release of their, of their actuarial data masters is, the, is, the, is where that information is located. We do now... Uh, Dr. Professor Schnicki, Gary Schnicki, did tell me that uh, those those rates uh, for for crops like corn and soybeans uh, are in that latest release, uh, so, but we're still kind of sorting through that and 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 hope to get some uh, plan to get some some farm doc posts out uh, with information about those. Obviously, for uh, for crop like wheat, um, those you know, the 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 purchase period for 2015 has already passed, and and the rates for those have been out and. And Gary did uh, do at least one Farm Doc Daily post on uh, rates and premiums for SCO for wheat. Um, but we'll get information out about uh, uh, corn and, and soybeans on those uh, now that those now that those are available. And you see the SCO estimates show up then, and uh, going back over to the APAS sample farms. Um, and one of the things we want to note is that SCO is not available in the 2014 crop year. It only becomes available for uh, certain counties uh, where there is data beginning with the 2015 crop year. So you'll see that in this sample farm uh, expected payment uh, screen that there is no SCO estimated for 2014, but it is estimated over the five-year average. Um, uh, as you see there, I've scrolled over that that bar. So SCO be becomes available in, in counties uh, where they can operate it um, beginning with the 2015 And, crop and maybe year. the other thing you could do, Jonathan, is, is go up to that coverage level uh, yeah. and, and just show, just show how that purple band, uh, changes. So if, if you're looking at 75% individual coverage, your, uh, your, the, the size of that purple SCO expected payment band will increase because SCO in that case is, is covering a larger portion. Uh, if you look at 85%, then, you know, an SCO policy would only be covering from 86% down to 85% and, and that, that, uh, expected payment level will shrink. So, um, you know, SCO, again, does have that fixed 86% trigger, and then the width of the band of coverage uh, increases as the as the in underlying individual coverage level uh, goes down. So, you know, as you reduce 
uh, individual coverage level, uh, the, the expected payment and the, the premium associated with the SCO plan that goes on top of that is going to increase. And we're going to go into a build your own farm real quick um, here to, to finish out. Um, we do want to note in the farm build toolbox, step seven is the sign up uh, uh, step for this whole process. Once you've gone through yields, base acres, ARC County and PLC, ARC individual and SCO. Um, this step will be updated further as we get forms from FSA. We'll provide some uh, fillable PDFs or other things that you can download, fill out, and, and put your uh, information on for the producer. And we'll keep the deadlines updated here as well. So this, this one uh, is currently um, the final step, but with the deadlines being into the future as they are, we, uh, we've just got the deadlines up there now, but we'll have some forms to use. And then uh, here with the last couple minutes, we've got, um, we want to show what uh, the build your own farm or this custom farm looks like really quickly. So I've got an example here on the left-hand side of just a, a, an example farm that we can enter in real quick um, and, and walk through how the build your own component for this APAS tool works. Nick, if, since I probably do not do a good uh, job of typing I'll, and talking at the same time, I'll, I'll talk, turn over. I'll talk through as you're filling things in. So, yeah, we just wanted to, again, this would be the full-blown uh, version of the, of the, uh, of the online tool. Uh, so on the left, you have the kind of all the information that the um, producer or landowner would need if they wanted to go through this uh, build-your-own-farm uh, sequence here and, and set this up. Um, so first step is selecting state, uh, county that the FSA farm is located and then entering in the, the total base acreage on the farm, uh, as well as the number of pay of payment entities that would be eligible for payments. Um, most cases that's probably going to be two if you're looking at a, a farmer and their spouse. Um, but it could be multiple payment entities depending on the, uh, uh, organizational structure, uh, of the operation. Um, and here's where you uh, set up all the all the crops um, with with base acres uh, on the farm. So uh, Jonathan's entering in uh, corn. Um, the uh, the the 2014 uh, planted acres for that crop. Um, we also asked some information about uh, insurance uh, units here uh, in the setup, which will be relevant for some of the. Uh, SCO calculations that are done uh, in the in the scenarios that the that the user can set up. Um, so we have a relatively simple farm here uh, with uh, corn and soybeans. Uh, corn and soybean base and, and corn and soybeans are what uh, is is planted in 2014. So Jonathan's got the uh, 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 kind of that initial information set up. Then we go to the program inputs. Here's where you're going to enter in um, the current base acres. Uh, for the crops and the current payment yields. Um, we also have the button down below these boxes that, that Jonathan's entering the values in where you could go in and, and, and compare the current base, the existing base that you see there, enter in the 2009 to 2012 planted acres uh, to get an optional reallocated base and then choose which uh, uh, values to use in there. We'll skip through that, but you can see that's available. And then if you choose the reallocated, it'll plug those into the program as well. Um, Same thing on the yield history. Um, so we could we could go go through here and, and enter in uh, the the yields from that 08 to 2012 period, which is relevant for updating payment yields. So you can see that updated payment yield number is being updated every time Jonathan enters a yield in the history. Uh, 2013 yield is also required uh, because that is part of the guarantee calculation for the ARC programs. All right, so he'll get those soybean yields entered as well. You can see here now the current payment yield versus the updated. In both cases, the updated is higher, so we'd, we'd advise you to select those updated payment yields. All right, now um, here's a little bit more flexibility on the on the future price levels uh, that the user uses here. So again, we have the three kind of national, uh, nationally recognized trusted sources of uh, price forecasts from USDA, Congressional Budget Office, and FAPRI. But the user can also enter in um, or adjust uh, those price forecasts. So if you think CBO is a little high, but USDA is a little low, 
um, you can look at uh, uh, different price forecast levels here using the custom option. All right, and then finally, um, the way it's set up is the user can look at three different program scenarios. Um, so in scenario one, Jonathan is choosing uh, Art County. Uh, in scenario two, he's choosing price loss coverage for corn. Um, and then adding SCO on top of that. In scenario three, he's chosen ARC individual, which will apply to both uh, corn and soybeans. Scenario one, going back, looking at ARC County for beans, price loss coverage for soybeans. Uh, yeah, in scenario I'm, two. And I'm just using the same. I mean, certainly this this can be used to make uh, multiple decisions on, on crop insurance as well. I'm just using the same crop insurance um, across the board. So we're just comparing at this point how the programs would look on this example farm. So here he's basically looked at a kind of a straight art county in scenario one, 80% revenue protection versus a PLC with 80% revenue protection on both crops in scenario two plus SCO versus um, an arc individual uh, along with 80% revenue protection on both crops uh, in scenario three. And I want to make, just before we, we run the scenarios, I want to make one uh, operational detail note here. You see this button that says export farm details. Um, what this will do will permit you to save all the information you've entered into the APAS custom farm tool on the individual's own computer. Um, we are not saving anything in any centralized database or holding this, this data that's entered by the farm. The producer can save it on their computer uh, using this export farm button here. It'll save as sort of like a, a text file or a cookie on the computer. And then at the very beginning um, of the process, there was a button that says load farm. You can then take this information you've entered previously and load it back up and then come back and run different scenarios against the same information. Um, mm -hmm. So that's available here. Um, and we'll um, run the scenarios now using the information we've entered and the prices, and you just kind of see, again, the same screen showing expected payments um, under the programs for those crops, comparing the, across the programs uh, for all crops, and the same, the capability to look crop by crop, where we no longer look at ARC individual because it's a, it's a whole farm program, but you can see uh, using those prices, uh, the scenarios with expected payments. Again, the one-year 2014 payment and the average over 2014 through 2018. And with that, um, we have crossed the 10 o'clock hour. Um, and if we've got any questions or uh, um, other comments or uh, notes, please let us know now. Um, but that there, uh, as, as we said, that is a good overview of the programs, the decisions, how things operate, and then how the web online web resources can be used to help um, to help uh, with this decision. So to help you help farmers and farmers to sort through it themselves. Um, uh, so, yeah, so that was the, the 2014 Farm Bill on about 57 minutes. <laughs> um, probably not enough time to clarify everything, but... Uh, Happy to happy to answer any questions anyone has. And John, if uh, you're on, Jim tells us he's unmuted uh, your microphone. If you had a few comments, um, certainly uh, we welcome any thoughts that you might have. And as, uh, anybody else, if you have questions, uh, please type them in now, and we'll we'll do our best to answer. Them. Well, John, I don't know that we've yet figured out how to make that work. Um, we apologize for that. Um, seeing no questions and knowing we've we've uh, probably stretched your patience with farm programs <laughs> about as far. Uh, oh, we do have a question here. What is going to be the best way to measure whether to reallocate your base? So that's a very good question and not an easy one to answer because um, there's a couple different ways to look at that base acre reallocation. Um, one of the ways is uh, getting a, an understanding of how the programs are going to pay. Since you're paying out on base acres and not planted acres, um, understanding how the programs uh, are, are expected to pay 
Uh, one school of thought is you want to see you want to see your base acre allocation um, that gets you the program that's going to pay the most. Uh, and, and in the Midwest, we think uh, Art County is going to be the uh, the most effective program, and thus for corn, and thus you you think of it that way. You look at those payments, and then you look at the reallocation, um, and and kind of the decision becomes: Does this reallocation get me more corn base, uh, or do I lose corn base to soybean base because soybeans are not going to uh, be as valuable in either of the programs? Mm. And so it's really an Art County versus PLC kind of decision, and it's a expected program decision. Nick, yeah, the other side of that is to try to think about your risk management and your what you might be planting on that farm in the future. Right. I mean, um, if you're if you're kind of thinking ahead to the the crops that you're going to be planting in the future, uh, compare those to to what your what what crops you have uh, in terms of your current base acres versus what your your reallocated base acres might look like. You might try to line those up. Yeah, choose the one that lines up a little bit better with what you plan on planting uh, over the farm bill. Just because you know if support is triggered um, in some of these crop specific programs. Uh, you probably want to have base uh, in in those crops that are that are that you're actually going to be planting because those are the the crops that are obviously experiencing some sort of uh, low price environment or low revenue environment uh, leading leading to a payment being triggered. Um, as and Jonathan it, said, you know, you know, kind of one of the broad things we advise is in the Midwest anyway is to is uh, if you can shift uh, base acreage uh, into uh, into corn, you know that's kind of a good idea. That's somewhat of a generalized statement. So we got to be a little bit careful with that. But corn is a higher value crop. Um, the programs, uh, the payments associated with the crops are kind of tied to the value associated with the crops. So regardless of what program you're looking at, you're probably going to get uh, uh, higher payments on uh, on, uh, on on any one of the programs on a, on a corn base acre than a soybean base acre if, if payments are triggered. Um, but you know that that's kind of an easy, broad statement to make for for corn and soybean country. You get into some of the outlying areas around the Corn Belt where you've got base and some other crops like wheat, barley. Um, you know where where reference price and market prices are. Yeah, and you know one of the, one of the examples if you've started planting wheat in recent years, then maybe you have a different thought if you can reallocate to get wheat base if you plan on doing so in the future. Um, but yeah, it's a great question, and it uh, it is going to be a bit of a struggle as as farmers sort through it, or as landowners sort through it, um, to understand how the the programs are going to pay, um, and what yeah. seems to make the most sense for that farm. Keeping in mind that that's the base acres on the farm, that's how they're going to be allocated going forward. So it doesn't and, change after this decision. And again, it you know for any given farm, there's going to be two choices uh, on the base reallocation. It's what your current base looks like versus what your reallocated base looks like. So it's not uh, there isn't a whole range of, of choices on base acres. It's it's one one base acre allocation, your current or your reallocation, which is based on your 2009 to 2012. So the first thing I would I guess advise people to do is figure out what those two choices look like. Um, are they significantly different? Do you have one that has base in barley and wheat and the other one now you're planting corn and soybeans so you're looking at you know a totally different configuration of of crops um in that in those reallocated base acres once you have those two numbers then do your program comparisons um and just see how um how the programs would work for those different crops if it's a clear choice between uh programs for some of those crops versus others and then kind of come back and look at your at your at your base acre um, choices again b- before you kind of finalize that decision. Well, we uh, we have probably exhausted your patience with this. Um, we do want to say thank you to uh, John and Sam in DC uh, for working with us to set this up and for all the help that your organization uh, from the National Corn Growers have have provided to us um, over time and and certainly throughout this process. Uh, we thank you for uh, spending some time with us this morning um, on the on this webinar. Uh, just as a reminder, um, if you're looking f- for more information, um, we will point you back to the Farm Bill Toolbox and uh, note that we've got another webinar coming up um, this Friday at 8 a.m. E- uh, Central Time. Uh, we're going to be looking more at the SCO program in this and, and running through the tools again. Uh, these are all archived, and we will send out a link 
um, for today's webinar as well as the information that we uh, went through today. Um, uh, when we get that up on the internet, uh, we'll get that out to you to uh, have uh, as as an archive for your use in the future if you need it. Um, with that, I think we'll let everybody go. Um, uh, we really appreciate the time you spent here with us this morning. If you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to uh, email us um, or track us down, and we will be glad to do so. We will be adding things like frequently asked questions as we go through um, uh, to the toolbox. But uh, I think with that, seeing no further questions or uh, issues, then we will, uh, we will sign off for now. Again, thanks a lot for joining us, and uh, thanks to the uh, National Corn Growers for, um, for all their help on, on this effort. Thanks. Bye.